welcome to today's episode. Today, we're going to be talking about why you might want to consider investing in Costa Rica. Now, I have with me today, Arthur Zwern. Arthur, welcome. Thank you. Nice to be so, here. So before we get into Costa Rica specifically, what are a few things that our listeners really should know about you? Well, I guess the first thing to know is I'm not your typical real estate developer or real estate investor even. I spent most of my career in high tech. Uh, my first degree was applied physics, uh, followed by a Harvard MBA, and I started high tech companies and invented a lot of things, won a lot of innovation awards, uh, commercialized a few things, did a bunch of things for the military, um, talking early virtual reality and drones, um, laser sensors, aerial photogrammetry, all kinds of things. So wow, uh, it was a really fun career. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Yeah, once my kids were born um, early this century, I said, you know, I need to back off a little bit because the problem is when you're doing a high tech startup in Silicon Valley, it's 18 hour days and you know that there's a bunch of kids just as smart as you with more energy than you, with more venture capital than you, trying to compete with you directly, right? So it's always a race. and. In real estate, it's not as much of a race. And I find that it's much easier to do creative real estate strategies, um, mainly because most people look at real estate as a box, right? You're going to build a box or you're going to flip, fix and flip a box or whatever. And I really look at the business inside the box, especially when it comes to commercial deals. And I, I look at the business inside the box as what makes the box truly valuable, right? Would you rather have a McDonald's in your corner lot, you know, on a, on a prime corner, or would you have Joe's Burger Shack? Well, I'd rather have McDonald's. They're going to pay more rent and they're a better tenant and what have you. Um, and if I own the McDonald's, I get all the profit, both from the real estate and the business in the box. So that's what I'm trying to do in real estate. And I guess it's how I ended up in Costa Rica because it's yeah, easy so, to do that there. Right, right. So the, the investments that you've done, you started here in the States. Uh, what, what were some of the investments you started with? Uh, in real estate, my first house was in the late 80s in the Rose Garden area of San Jose. Um, it was a fixer and it was a stretch because it was the top of the market. And I bought it, I think, for $170,000 thinking, oh my God, am I doing the right thing, right? And the only reason I could afford it was because the garage was converted and there was a renter in it already. So it covered part of my cash flow. Um, that house, we ended up buying the one next door when it went into probate for a really seriously better even price. And we ended up selling them both um, during the boom in the, you know, 2004, I think it was, or somewhere around there for many hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of dollars each, right? And they were fixed up and beautiful. In one case, we sold it to our tenant, right? So it, it was just easy, you know, no realtor needed even, right? We just right. made a deal and signed on the line and that was it. Um, when I bought my third house in San Jose, we kept the first two and, that, and the third house was in Willow Glen, um, which we just sold last year when we moved to Fair Oaks, uh, which is near Sacramento. Okay. But uh, after the dot-com crash, I thought, you know, a couple legs of the stool financially in Silicon Valley have gotten cut out from under me. And so I want to diversify my real estate holdings out beyond the Silicon Valley, where I'm not only subject to economic cycles based on technology, but also earthquake risk. And I said, let's diversify a little bit out of earthquake risk because you can't even buy decent insurance for that risk. Right. So I um, did a lot of studying and the first place we went was Park City, Utah. And the reason for that, the first reason was going skiing became a real drag from Silicon Valley. Driving to Tahoe took too long. It would become an eight, 12 hour drive. And we, my wife and I said, what's the closest ski resort we can fly to? And that was Park City, Utah. So we bought a condo there and then realized the Olympics were coming and it was gonna kind of light a fire under property values. So we bought a mansion there and some land and a couple more houses and a couple more condos and basically built a little real estate empire there. Um, and in 2006, we sold out of most of that and bought apartments in Dallas. Great, great timing. So, yeah. Well, 
it was great timing to sell, but it was a mistake to then buy apartments in Dallas because even though you think apartments do well when houses don't, it doesn't quite work that way. And so when there's a big crash and in that crash, housing crashed, but also apartments crashed, right? When the economy goes down, apartments are seriously leveraged. And a lot of new apartment buyers don't understand this or syndication investors or whatever, they don't understand this, but you get leverage because when the economy goes down, your rents go down, your occupancy goes down, the concessions you need to pay people go up, your turnover goes up, your evictions go up. So you got a lot of costs going up, you've got your revenues going down, so your NOI, your net operating income gets really squished, right? At the same time as that, cap rates are usually going up because people are more averse to risk and interest rates might have gone up or it's harder to get debt. So all of a sudden cap rates go way up, which is a multiplier on your lower NOI. And you can quickly find that if you put 30% down on a property and there's a downturn a couple of years later, you've lost more than 30% of the equity if you tried to sell it. Um, and if it's three or five years later when your loan's coming up and you're trying to sell it or refinance it, you can get wiped out. Right? Uh, so um, well, the key in 2006 was not such a great idea. I managed to get through it and learned a heck of a lot, but I would have rather been just sitting aside on cash and, you know, watching all of the adventures go by. Right? I see. I see. And then how did you make the, the jump to Costa Rica? Um, I did more and more apartments in Texas. And around 2014, I started seeing signs that the debt bubble that blew up in 2008, 2007 is reinflating. And the reason it's reinflating is the Fed said, we'll just cut interest rates down to zero. So everybody can have all the money they want. And anybody with a pulse has been able to go out and get all the money they want at really low interest rates. And what, that, what that's done is it's leveraged up the US government, corporations, individuals, hedge funds, institutions, everybody that buys real estate, for one thing, has gotten leveraged up with low interest and they um, basically push the prices up, right? It's, it's debt-induced asset inflation, right? Which will probably be followed by, by sort of real prices inflation for the consumer, but the asset inflation worries me because eventually rates revert. And when rates revert, those cap rates are gonna go back up and the values are gonna uninflate. And so I said, what if there's another place I can go to that isn't subject to these debt induced bubbles because it doesn't have a good debt market? And what if it's a really nice place to go? So managing properties there or even being an investor in properties there is a lot more fun than, than C-class apartments in Texas where you're fighting bed bugs and gang fights and pregnancies and, and whatever, right? It's always drama. In, in these sort of typical apartments, right? Uh, but when you're managing an A-plus sort of um, short-term rental property, you have much higher class problems, right? Sure, you have to exceed every guest expectation and make the property really good, but that's not such a bad thing. It means you have to go there and find all the little problems in the nits and make the property better all the time. Well, you're making a great property better in paradise. So, you know, that's not a bad management job, I'll tell you that, right? Um, and so I started looking and I looked at several other countries, right? And I looked at Mexico, for example, and I got very scared, right? The government there sometimes takes away your properties and the banditos take away your money or your life, right? And, and so there's a lot of problems in Mexico, um, on, on rankings of economic safety for investors. It's like in the fourth quartile of the world, it's like number 91 out of whatever, 120 or something. Costa Rica's in the top quartile, right? Night and day difference in safety as an investor or even just walking down the street, right? So you can drink the water in Costa Rica, right? Pretty much everything that you could be scared of as a tourist or an investor, when you look at Costa Rica, you go, I don't have that problem here, right? It's just, it, it even comes down to your US appliances plug right in the wall without any problem. It just, it's just very easy to be there. Uh, the legal system's easy to understand. And probably the most important thing is the locals really like us, right? Gringo is not a derogatory term there. It's just what we describe, you know, Americans as. Um, and Tico is, or Tica as the feminine is what we call the locals. And that's not derogatory either. It's just a descriptor, right? Mm -hmm. and 
what's unique about Costa Rica, the, the most important thing to me, is the government has its priorities straight and the locals are happy, right? So they're happy to see us. The, the most important thing to the government is clean water. So you can basically drink out of any tap in the country. Uh, because of that, they have public health, so they have a better rated public health system than the U.S. They have good education, so they have higher literacy than the U.S. They don't have an army, so they could spend money on things that are good for their population. And it's been a stable democracy since 1948. It's the oldest one in Latin America. So you go there, you can almost forget you're in a foreign country. It feels less sort of Latin American than a lot of parts of Los Angeles or you know California in general. Yeah, and th that that's interesting. I, I, one of my first thoughts was in developing countries, what are the risks? What, I mean, well, not being a local, getting into a, a different culture where there's a lot of unknowns, but that, that sounds like you've done a lot of research and it sounds like the... There's a learning curve, mm -hmm. but, you know, I tell people now, my learning curve was bigger going from California to Texas than going from Texas to Costa Rica, okay? The laws are very different in Texas than California. Tenants, tenant landlord laws are completely different. Judges act differently. Taxation is different. Property taxes, everything's different, right? So you go to Costa Rica, the differences are on the same order of magnitude as the differences between Texas and California, and then you have a language issue. I don't speak Spanish. Anybody that speaks Spanish can go down there and do what I'm doing probably better, right? But I seem to be doing okay so far because I've surrounded myself with really good bilingual people. Um, another thing that's important to know, Costa Rica is tiny. It's less than 5 million population, right? Um, the entire tourism industry there is a 30th the size of Mexico's, but it's 15% of the gross national product. So tourism is a huge part of the economy down there. The government supports it. The people support it. They know it's why they have good jobs and, and a lot of foreign money coming in, not just from the tourists, but also from investment, because a lot of the investments foreign investment to build the tourism assets. So they know how their bread gets buttered. And I look at that and I go, it's 15% of their economy, and it's growing almost 10% a year and has since the turn of the century, right? When the dot-com thing crashed, when 2008 crashed, took a little blip down, like 10% down, and then set another record the next year, right? And I go, that's a resilient external growth driver, right? Find me a market with that resilient of an external growth driver. It's 15% of their economy growing roughly 10% a year. So it's like 1.5% you know, GNP growth every year just from tourism in that country, right? And then if you look at tourist, you know, tourist opinions, right? When they do studies and surveys of tourists, it's the top country tourists recommend, international tourists recommend that their friends visit. And then when you do happiness surveys of the locals, number one in the world. I, I was just gonna say that you and I had been talking about this earlier and the, the, uh, the happiness rating. Um, just describe a little bit of how you, uh, how you found that. Um, you know, you can Google it. I, I was looking at one the other day where they did a, a chart on one axis was like per capita average income. And on the other axis was how happy the population reports itself, right? And there's this trend line that sort of heads up all across the world where with more income, people are generally happier. Um, and you see that a lot of the Middle Eastern nations are way below the trend line, even the rich oil countries, because people aren't terribly happy there. And then you see a few countries way outliers at the top. And Costa Rica is this little tiny dot, way outlier, where it's like the happiest country in the world, even though the average income is only like, whatever, $13,000 a year or something. And so I look at why are the people happy there, right? Because happy locals means happy tourists, right? They're not looking at you going, I want what you have. They're looking at you going, how can I help you? Let's have a good time, right? The, the national greetings. Pura Vida, it's like, means good life, happy life, right? Um, so I, I just, I look at that whole formula that they've got there and I say, it's sustainable. The, the national electric grid is over 99% renewable. No other country can say that, right? And, and so you just look down the list, and you go, somehow they got it right, right? 
And, and there's no, no indication that that's about to change in any way either, uh, like the indicator of uh, the, the economy and the, the tourism, all of that, it's still projected to continue. I mean, there's a global worldwide financial crash. Tourism will take a hit. Property values will take a hit, whatever, but it'll come back, right? I know that, right? I know it'll come back because it's so undervalued, right? But you mentioned developing countries and different developing countries are very different. Okay. I was in Nicaragua in February. So three months ago, beautiful country, but terrifically poor. Okay. Now there's rioting in the streets because it's terrifically poor. It's not governed right. Right. So one thing I learned when I was there, I was at a financial conference and one of the women there was very, very sort of detail oriented and fact focused. And she was looking up on Google facts, right? And she found, that the per capita income in Nicaragua was $580 a year, right? Which is like $50 a month. And the per capita income in Costa Rica next door was like 12,800 a year. So it's a thousand dollars a month. So it's like a factor of 20. And okay, well, there's a good, easy way to look at two developing countries and go, one's a frontier country with a lot of risk still. And one is a developed a developing country right? Where your cell phone works and you can get around with ways and, and drink the water and whatever, right? Um, it's a developed, developing country. And so Americans, I think, should get out of the country more, right? There's a lot of countries in the world that are way more advanced than ours. I won't call Costa Rica one of them. But in the Far East, you go to some Asian countries and just look at their airports, look at their roads, look at their telecommunication systems, look at, I mean, look at like, WeChat in China is much bigger than Facebook in the U.S., right? And, you know, everybody does everything on their phones there much more than we do, right? So I like to look at different countries and see what they do and try to learn from it and not just look at how we do it here, right? Okay. Now, we are working on a project together in Costa Rica right now. And so I'm, I'm familiar with some of the structures, with the entity structuring. Could you describe that? for our listeners, a combination of how real estate, what forms of ownership uh, are used for real estate and what forms of protection there are for investors that may invest in, in uh, Costa Rica. Costa Rica is a rule of law country. It's a democracy. It has a constitution. Um, title to a property is well respected there and the courts respect it. If you make a loan with a mortgage, you can foreclose, and it's sort of like a fast foreclosure state in the U.S. Um, you can own property in your own name in Costa Rica as an American. Um, it's nice because uh, you don't have to report a lot to the IRS. It's one of the few things you don't have to report to the IRS is property held in your own name internationally. I don't recommend you hold property in your own name because if you pass, you then have to deal with Costa Rican estate law. Um, it's so what we do, especially since we have investors in our deals is we hold the property in a Costa Rican SRL, which is basically like an LLC, right? Same concept. And that SRL is owned by a U.S. LLC. And then we invest in the U.S. LLC. So when we do syndications and properties in Costa Rica to the investor, it looks exactly like a U.S. deal. You're becoming a member in an LLC. You're buying membership interest in an LLC. You get a K-1 at the end of the year and file a tax return. As long as you own less than 10% of the deal or 9.9%, basically, you don't have to do all the fancy reporting to the IRS about foreign ownership holdings and all that. But don't take my word for it. Ask your CPA um, because I can't give uh, tax advice, right? Uh, but the, the point is we try to make it very simple and we make it so that you're LLC membership interests can be held in your living trust or however you do your family estate planning, just like any other investment you own in the U.S. And so it, it works pretty smoothly that way. So I understand you say, you to say that the entity structuring, the protections would be very similar to what, what they are in the States. Yeah, it's, 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 I would call it analogous, right? And mm. very similar. And I trust a court in Costa Rica to uphold the rule of law as much as I trust a court in the U.S. to uphold a rule of law, right? And there's also some simplicity aspects there, which are nice. 
there's only one national registry for property titles and all those kinds of aspects, um, deeds and mortgages and things recorded against a property. So when you need to do a title search, there's only one place to look. It's either recorded in the national registry or it doesn't matter, right? It's, it, it's that simple, right? That's a lot simpler than in this country where you gotta get a, a title insurance company to go search 20 different databases to just give you an insurance uh, in case they didn't find something, right? So it's a lot simpler there. So is um, entitlements and construction permitting. Again, there's one national environmental agency your plan has to pass. Whereas here in California, there's state, there's local, there's federal, there's there's a long list, right? There you Which go. Which I think is that's an important agency. Yeah, that's an important point because I know that in we've done a lot of projects here in the states, and and there just is a lot of variation between the the governing. Uh, bodies, whether it's the municipality or the state or the mm -hmm. uh, whatever, the national building code, all of that. And in some cases, it can really cause challenges and delays and, and just a lot of extra work. And so oh, having that, that very, the basic uh, uh, uniform code where it's only one one code to follow it it would seem like that it makes it a lot more predictable right it means that your engineer knows what he's got to design and it's just gonna fly right you don't need to worry about it getting kicked back mm -hmm. or something you didn't know hitting you in the process because it's yeah. all cut and dry. another unique aspect of of costa rica is and if you can share your thoughts on this the 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 idea that of developing and developed country. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Let, me, let me give you a few aspects of that because it's really central and important, okay? In the U.S., we have uh, multiple listing services and we have Zillow and LoopNet and all of these sort of online engines that create a marketplace for real estate. So if I want to look at a property in the U.S., I can figure out what it's worth in about 10 minutes by using data online, right? I can look at comps and blah, blah, blah. I can do my own little appraisal in 10 minutes. Um, if I want to buy or sell a property, I can put it online in one of those marketplaces and a million buyers see it in 10 minutes, right? Um, if I want to get a loan on one of those properties, I can go online and get a loan from, you know, Zillow or whoever, 10 million different lenders, and I can line that up in 10 minutes, okay? In Costa Rica, you have none of that. There's no multiple listing service. There's no good online marketplace. There's no good lending infrastructure. So what that means, first of all, is there's no good price discovery mechanism. If you really know what you're doing, you know what a property could really be bought for, low, low, low ball, and you know what it can really be sold for, high, high, high. But whoever you're sitting there with might not know, right? They probably don't because there is no comps there's no sort of you know easy way to know think what things are worth you got to really dig it second it's mostly cash deals because there's no good lending infrastructure if you're lucky you get a 50 percent loan to value mortgage takes eight months to get and your interest rates like eight nine percent that's from the national bank or you know a real bank lender um so a lot of deals are cash seller financing it's almost as if every deal is off market Sort of like in the U.S., a really off-market deal that's literally not listed anywhere. Every deal there is almost like that, right? So it's a very in inefficient market. Very it, inefficient. It sounds, may not sound good, but it, it really can be. It's really good. For investors. It's really good. What it means is I can go to five sellers who are listing their property and can't sell it because nobody even knows and go, I'll take any one of those five, whoever takes my low ball offer first, right? And one of them is going to go, God, I've been trying to sell this property for a long time. Thank you, right? So, so there's a lot of that, right? We can buy low. Um, we can also sell at full first world prices in most cases if there's a good, if it's a good product, right? Like the the first project I did there was a beachfront mansion right near the project we're doing now. We bought it for a million eight fifty, um, improved it a little bit. Um, it's a rental. We do weddings there and events. It's it's like A plus plus VIP world class. You know, a billionaire would be happy to rent it or buy it. Um, well, now we've listed for sale three point seven million. 
right? Which is a first world beach price in Hawaii or California, it'd be 27 million. Mm. But there it's 3.7, it's still twice what we paid three years ago, which is a pretty good deal on a, on a trophy asset that you know you're not gonna get hurt owning, right? Beachfront property in a country where beachfront title is rare um, is a good asset, right? So then we get to the cost structures, right? I can, I can build or operate tourism properties with Costa Rican cost structures. So a lot of like the base labor rate is maybe 250 an hour plus benefits. They get really good benefits there if you're legal, which we're always legal. Um, but the rates are terrifically low. I can get an artisan welder or woodworker for $3 an hour. Okay. So do you import kitchen cabinets from Europe or do you just build them out of beautiful local wood? You build them out of beautiful local wood and everything's custom, right? And it's very, very cheap. But when, an American or a European or an Asian buyer shows up to look at the property. They don't know how much you paid for your labor and they don't care. They see the price, they see the property, they go, this is beautiful. I'll buy it. Right. Or the nightly rate, right. The nightly rate for something might be $200 or a thousand dollars or whatever it is. Your customer is a first world tourist who's used to paying that in New York or Paris or wherever they go. Right. I was in Thailand this year. You can get rooms there for $25, but, we stayed for a week at a resort that was $325 a night, right? It was beautiful and the service was impeccable. That's the kind of thing we can do in Costa Rica. We can give you impeccable service because we can throw a lot of well-trained people at it with real simple goals, which is exceed guest expectations every chance you get, right? Real simple. And, and then I can have five people per villa working full time to make sure that happens and, it, and, and easily covered in the economics. So to sort of put that short, we get a very inefficient market, which we know how to take advantage of. Um, and we get first world pricing, but developing world costs. Okay. And yeah. And so you have investments in Costa Rica right now. You've, you, they're going really well. You're obviously very detail oriented and um, uh, very analytical. What, what got you or, the the ecotourism part of it can you can you describe that a little bit more what how would you uh, des describe that absolutely uh, costa rica has more of its country as national park than any other country in the world over 25 percent of its land is national park um, it has arguably the world's highest species diversity so on 0.03 percent of the land mass you've got like 10% of the world species or something crazy like that. I don't remember the exact number, but it's beautiful, right? It's an amazing place to go and see wildlife. And a lot of people go there for that, right? And I look at that and I go, and, and Costa Rica protects the national parks very carefully. They protect their water. They're looking at banning single use plastics and perhaps being the first country in the world to do that because single use plastics really hit sea life very hard, right? It's a big pollutant in the sea that kills turtles and birds and fish and, and what have you. Um, so Costa Rica is really at the forefront of being eco-conscious. Like I said, 99 plus percent of the energy is renewable. So I look at that and I go, let's try to take that to the next level and be a model of that. And what I saw as a tourist in Costa Rica is a lot of the eco-tourism is what I would call eco-viewism. Let's go look at these monkeys. Let's go look at this. Let's go look at that. Take pictures, go ooh and ah, and tell our friends what we saw. And I think about that and I go, so what did that really do for the species? Did that really help the environment at all? You could argue that some of the tourist dollars ended up supporting national parks and what have you, which is true. Um, but I look at it and I go, is there a way to directly support the environment? And is there, is there a market for tourists who want to come actually do something instead of just watch. And I think there's a big market of people who want to do things in the world, not just look at things in the world, right? It's the difference between being a, a maker and a consumer, right? And not everybody wants to consume all the time. Sometimes we want to create. So what we're doing on Playa Grande, which is a, a beach where the leatherback turtles and other turtles have been nesting for probably 200 million years or something, nobody really knows, um, is we want to invite people to come help save the turtles, not just look at them. 
as so, well as other at-risk wildlife on Playa Grande. It's a very unique and amazing natural environment on the planet. The the leatherback that that's a hu- that can be a huge uh, turtle. Can you de- describe that turtle? Leatherback turtle is the world's oldest and largest marine reptile. Uh, it can weigh two thousand pounds, which is and be the size of a Volkswagen Bug. Okay, so it's a giant. And they're severely endangered, at risk of extinction. Um, it might even be too late to save them. Nobody really knows. But we're going to give it a try. And we're confident we can bring more resources to the problem of saving them and help with some good science and conservation. Um, both things we could do at the beach and things that our guests can do, tweeting and Facebooking and writing letters to Congress people and so forth. Because some of the problems the turtles face happen all across the ocean. So the, your vision with that now, the, this particular property that we that we're working on together, it is right right on the beach. Well, basically on the beach. It's about a hundred meters from the beach. There's a buffer zone, a natural park buffer zone, to keep development away from the turtles because the turtles nest on the beach, and you don't want lights and human activity disturbing them. So we have a buffer zone between us at the beach and during turtle season at night when the turtles are nesting, you only go out on the beach when you're with a properly guided tour, right? In our case, it'll be a properly guided, like, you know, rescue mission or protection mission, right? The nests need to be protected and marked. In some cases, nests need to be removed and put in an incubator if they're at risk from the tides or from seabirds and what have you. So. There's actions that can be done right on the beach to help the turtles and more volunteers doing that will help. We will have our own scientific sort of organizing of that, but we're also going to work with local environmental agencies who do this to help their programs. So we're in the stage right now of develop, getting the land ready for development. Can you describe your Describe the the project a bit, but also even more so, describe your vision for what that will look like when it's done. What is what is what is the big picture? Absolutely, absolutely. the The land has been in the process of getting entitled to do a fourteen lot horizontal gated condominium community. So it's uh, six and three quarter acres of land just off the beach that's slated to be subdivided into lots that are about 1,500 square meters. So what is that, like a third of an acre roughly each. Um, And then on each lot, presumably in the original entitlements, you would sell the lots and somebody would bring in an architect and build a villa and do their own thing and be in a homeowners association. Well, I looked at that and I said, if you built 14 random villas on the beach and 14 different owners and 14 different management companies managing the rentals, you're going to have potentially up to a hundred people on the beach unsupervised that weren't there before. And that might actually be bad for the turtles, not good. And so I said, what could you do here that would actually be good for the turtles and the other wildlife there instead of risking them? And the answer became that we don't, want to just sell lots and let people build villas. We want to build all the villas and build them properly. And then we want to, and here's the key, we want to manage all the rentals of these villas and manage all the operations so that we can create a a focused brand to the tourism community and also control the operations very carefully to protect the wildlife and to help educate the guests and, and otherwise make sure their stay is wonderful, right? We can get economies of scale by running 14 bills instead of one. And we can also achieve consistency, sort of like McDonald's said, we're going to have everything the same at every McDonald's. We're going to have things the same at every villa, right? So we can predict the guest experience and manage it and make sure it's a great guest experience, which is the key. So we're going to be going after a market here that's uh, mostly millennials and they want authentic vacation experiences. They want unique adventure experiences. They don't want to do the same old, same old. They want to do something new and different and amazing. And today that means you go to Galapagos or Africa and you spend, you know, 10 or $20,000 for this unique tour. We're going to allow people to do it for typical rates they would spend to do a beachfront vacation in Costa Rica, which is much, much less than that. So in designing the villas, 
we have to follow a lot of uh, very strict environmental requirements in terms of height and footprint on the lot and so on. So we're at the early stages now of designing these villas and we're probably gonna go with a Balinese courtyard design. So imagine rooms surrounding a central courtyard. The central courtyard has a little plunge pool. Um, the rooms probably have little tubs or jacuzzis up on the roof or a little roof deck. Um, we're only allowed to go six meters in height which makes two stories hard, but it doesn't make one story with a roof deck hard at all. So we get creative within the parameters we have. And it sort of blends, it blurs the difference between indoor space and outdoor space. Um, and it also will allow us to rent the entire villa to a group or rent individual suites in that villa to individual couples and then use the common areas in the villa for an event or a yoga class or a movie or whatever we might want to do with the common area during that time. So we'll have very flexible inventory, which is a rare and unique thing um, that allows us to market through hotel channels as well as villa rental channels. And I'm real excited about that. Okay. Okay, great. Another interesting thing about the villas is that when we started laying these out around the courtyards, it looked a little bit like a turtle. And I think we might end up with a villa footprint that looks like a turtle from space. So if you can imagine a collection of 14 turtles from space, I look at that and I go, there's an opportunity to get this project some serious attention, you know, on uh, architectural digest or national geographic or whatever, you know, the, the marketing specialists are yet to be hired for that kind of thing. But I do see opportunities to do that. And that's the kind of attention we want because we not only want to attract attention, to our project for people to come stay there or buy the villas if we decide to sell them. But we also want to attract attention to the plight of the turtles and other species in amazing areas like this that are you know, at risk of going, going, gone if we don't start to do more. And, and that more is, I looked at it and I went, nonprofits and NGOs and NPOs and governments can only do so much, but in the end, if you structure a business model that makes profit by doing an environmental good rather than environmental bad, that business model can succeed. It can attract money because you've got a profit motive in place instead of just do good or motive. So I think we can attract money easier than doing a nonprofit to save turtles and we can generate more money every year and more um, human resources in terms of volunteer hours every year doing it as a for-profit. It's an adventure. You're going to go on a night tour to hunt for turtle nests dressed in black with infrared cameras and things like that. It's going to be very exciting and fun, right? And people will pay for that. And some of what they pay is going to go help nature, right? And, and will there works. be the, the experience of someone staying at the villas? Uh, can you describe, uh, and maybe it's still in the development stages, but the different things that, that uh, uh, people visiting may be able to do to, to assist? I know well, you mentioned the social media part of it, uh, getting word out that way, but what are some other ideas you have? And is there, is there any sort of a model that you're following that you've seen uh, other, mm -hmm. other uh, efforts like this? Well, in, in terms of assisting, what I'm looking at is, I, I look at this as a science project. And of course, I'm a scientist, really, not a real estate developer. So I'm trying to look at the available science, and I've looked at some reports by international consortia of turtle nonprofits, right, where 30 plus groups got together and said, we need a plan, right? What are we going to do? And I've looked at their plans, and then I've looked at what's the activity that's been going on in Playa Grande in our location, and I've said, how can we better support those plans in a way that creates a compelling experience for our client market? And I'm finding ways and I can tie the early, you know, it's still very early stage, but I'm in the early stages of designing programs and plans and, and things we can do. And then tying it right back to international goals for turtle conservation. Right? And I'm not going to do all this myself. I've got feelers out to hire a turtle scientist, right? A conservation expert, domain expertise in the field in Costa Rica to lead our the scientific aspects of our effort and our overall conservation program. Because it, it, it sort of starts from two philosophical precepts. First, I look at it like um, what 
what what people ascribe to the Hippocratic Oath that doctors that doctors have to take, right? Which is first do no harm. So I look at it and I say, first we have to look at everything we're going to do from the way we build the buildings to the way we run them and make sure we're not doing harm to turtles or other living things. Second, once we're sure of that in some engineering, scientifically measurable way, we say, now how do we do good? And that's where our programs come in. And the program's really simple. I, I go, if I, if I take average nightly rates for a property like this in that area and average occupancies and all that, and I charge a $5 a night per person turtle tax, and that all goes right to turtle conservation and scientific research and whatever, that works out to close to 10,000 a year per villa, right? And if I say, you know, we really, when you come here, we really want you to allocate half an hour a day during the course of your stay to doing something. People are going to be like, yeah, there's nothing, right? One tour that I'm going to pay for, I'll cover that, right? Um, that's a thousand hours a year per villa, right? There, right. So multiply that by 14 villas, and I go, now we got a program, right? We got some critical mass. We then show up to the nonprofit organizations full of scientists and researchers who are dying for more resources to go patrol the beach more and do this more, do that more. We say, we got some money, we got some people let's work together, right? Because we're actually environmentalists here, not evil developers, right? So, and I'm trying to walk the walk. If you look at my first project in Costa Rica, which is two miles as the crow flies from this new project, we put 80 solar panels on the roof of this mansion, 25 kilowatts. It's the first solar house on the beach in the whole area. We changed all of the cleaning chemicals to bio-friendly, earth-safe. Why? Because everybody's on septic there. The new project will be on a, on a waste treatment plant to be even cleaner than septic. And our used wastewater from the villas will end up being used for irrigation because during the dry season, there's water shortages. And so we want to conserve water. Um, we're going to design our landscaping. Instead of hiring a landscape designer who looks at what's pretty usually, we're hiring a permaculture farming expert who teaches courses in how to design a permaculture farm, right? And the, the mission I've given him and the requirements, the statement of work was create a food forest for local at-risk wildlife, right? We have a limit of 40% of our 6.75 acres that can be covered with buildings and pools and things like that. The other 60% is gonna be planted. And so what do we plant it with? Well. What's at risk that we can feed or shelter or attract to this property so that we offset the decimation of species that's been happening in this amazing location? We haven't even talked about the location yet. On one side of us is this amazing beach with the turtles that we've talked about. It's also a globally renowned surfing beach with amazing surfing. The surfers love it. It also is, looks like a pristine desert island beach from the beach side because of that hundred meter buffer of forested area between the development and the beach. So it's an incredible beach. A couple hundred meters the other side of us is a giant estuary that's also a national park, internationally recognized and protected, full of rare birds and crocodiles and monkeys and butterflies and hummingbirds and uh, amazing species diversity, right? And we want to protect that. We're going to be very close to that habitat. Um, you can walk there. It's like a city block from where you're going to be sleeping at this place, right? So the, uh, the ability to, to interact with nature here is incredible. We want those interactions to bring something to nature, not take it away. We're going to equip people with collection bags so when they see trash anywhere, they pick it up. And we're going to teach about leave no trace and how that's a principle you can use in your everyday life. Anytime you're in a park or a beach, pick something up, just leave the world a little better than you found it and practice that on little scales, it becomes a habit, right? And then you get to practice it on big scales, like doing a project like this, right? Or making money doing a project like this, right? Our investors, I expect are gonna make really good returns. I expect we'll make really good returns. I'm trying to design this project so we make better returns by doing something good for the environment than we would if we just built another four-star beach accommodation there, which would certainly make money. Everybody else there makes money. But if we make it special, we can make more money and do something really powerful. That's wow. what it is. What a vision. That's, uh, that's, that's really amazing. Uh, if, if listeners or investors want to 
follow this project or just get more information about it, what, what's the best way for them to reach out? Well, if you want direct information, you can reach me anytime, uh, Arthur at nextlevelassets.com, A-R-T-H-U-R. Uh, to keep up with Turtles First as it progresses, I would look on Facebook. We have a web page for Turtles First, mostly focused on the science and environmentalist outreach and public relations and things like that. It's less focused on um, you should invest in this, here's why, or anything like that, right? Um, we also have a web page at turtlesfirst.com. It's a very preliminary, sort of a preview teaser site. Um, to access it, it, you need an access code. Um, that access code is here to preview. H E R E, the digit two, P R E V I E W. Um, and then also at nextlevelassets.com, there's a teaser page that shows up in the banner. Just click on it and you'll get there. So. Right, and we'll we'll get that in the in the show notes so that uh, people can can reach out. This uh, this has been really a, a great session, Arthur. Really appreciate you taking the time. Now, what I do is I will give you the opportunity to have the last word. What would you say to our listeners? Uh, what's one key takeaway you'd like our listeners to to get from? everything we've talked about, about Costa Rica. I'll give you just a couple really quick. One, if you have not visited Costa Rica, go, even if it has nothing to do with investing. Um, but if it does have something to do with investing, uh, the way I look at it, your due diligence trip is like your life's best vacation or else don't invest, right? Because that's the whole point. Um, second thing, Costa Rica is an outlier. It's a good outlier in the world an amazing enclave of environmental consciousness and social inclusiveness and, and happy vibes, right? And, and to go with the natural beauty. Um, third, when you look at real estate, try to look at the business in the box. I'm spending a lot of time creating the box to be the best box it can be for the business in the box, but it's all about the business in the box that drives all the rest of our decisions. So look at, the, the business, not just the construction or the land or the location, you know, try to maximize the value of that location and box for a purpose. That's it. Great. Great. Well, thank you very much, Arthur. And yeah. oh. look forward to another session here very soon. I really appreciate you having me and uh, happy investing everyone. <laughs> <laughs>